Welcome once again to Arctic Fire. This unique gathering of swordsmiths explores the outer edge of the craft, where craftsmanship, artistry, storytelling, history, and myth combine. This year, the group has recreated objects found in the legendary horde of Grendel, from the most ancient surviving poem in Old English, Beowulf. Four days of live broadcast in which legends will be reborn. Arctic Fire 2016, Grendel's Horde. Arctic Fire. Um, this was uh, an idea that uh, I came up with uh, after attending the Ashokan Sword um, show about six years ago, and I started calling these guys and bugging them. Dude, you want to come to my, my uh, house and do a hammering? What do you think, man? And they're all like, yes, sort of. Like, when? Now. Like, right now. Like, like in a month from now. Like, oh. But you have to understand, I've said this before. Imagine, like, you're, like, totally into golf, and, like, you're just sitting there going... Hey, I wonder if I could call up Tiger Woods and just have him come up and play some golf with me and just call him and be like, hey, you want to come up and like have beer and play golf? And he's like, well, yeah, dude, I'm totally going to do that. That's what this is like. So, um, uh, and one of the things that's, and this is us in 2013, the group shop with the artifact. This is, an, <laughs> this is my favorite shot, uh, 2013. For the Arctic fires, for some reason, we always go on a hike afterwards and we go up in the mountains. It was misty. And uh, that's uh, Jake right in on Petter's shoulders there. Uh, so, and this is Michael. Michael Pakula, he couldn't make it this year, but we miss you, Michael, wish you were here. Um, and that's us in London, where one of the things that association with this group um, allows me to do is something that I've wanted to do but not had uh, the ability or the knowledge to do until I met Peter and these guys, is to actually document um, historic swords. This is in Uppsala, documenting a Viking sword. Um, I think this was actually the Viking sword that was shown earlier in your presentation, wasn't it, Jake? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And, uh, and take photos in actual museums, and this is us before a um, rune stone in Copenhagen. So that was a really neat trip. And it was also on that trip that um, this idea of Grendel's Horde was discussed, and also when the person that uh, anonymously gave us these sketches and, and other artifacts of the Horde were revealed to us. And um, I have to admit that I'm the skeptic of the group on this entire project. Um, I am fascinated by this sketch. I think it's a beautiful blade. Um, however, there's certain things about it that cause me immediately to go, ah, you know, we've got a type of pommel that is, and these guys know a lot more about this than I do, so I'm probably wrong, but I'm just, like there's a pommel that is from the Bronze Age, but this is clearly a pattern welded blade and it's a torsion pattern welded blade, so it's very advanced uh, pattern welding. And we just don't see, this is very anachronistic. Um, and uh, it, it's actually, uh, and there's a um, Etruscan style rune here, uh, which is a much later uh, type of runes, I understand, than what you would find on any sort of Bronze Age weapon. So to me, it doesn't matter. I was interested in making, a, making hunting the sword because it's an interesting story. And um, the one thing that we kind of do is we tell stories through blades. <clears throat> and it actually is very, very reminiscent to this blade that was in a book that I have. Um, and it's, uh, it was found in uh, Fermo, Italy, I believe, um, from the Etruscan period, and it's obviously a bronze sword. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to, um, the reason this, this design spoke to me is um, I wanted to have something, that, a design that captured the spirit of the sword hunting as it appears in the text. And there's a lot of um, discussion about, because hunting, I will tell you about it in just a second, but there's theories about why hunting does what it does in the text. And there's different potentials there, but all of them are not, are dark. So we wanted a sort of a dark, sinister shape. And I think this meets that criteria quite well. It's very interesting. So what does it say about hunting? in the text. Um, this is uh, the translation that is in Davidson's te text, The Sword in Anglo-Saxon England. 
And it says, uh, this sword, which Hrothgar's thile, that means kind of like a member of his court, lent to Beowulf in his need was by no means the least powerful allies, least powerful of allies. That Haftimus bore the name of Hrunting. It was among the foremost of ancient treasures. Its edged blade was of iron, gleaming with twigs of venom, and hardened by the blood of battle. Um, so here's what happens in the poem. Um, when Beowulf first comes to the hall, he is uh, confronted by this kind of a jerk character called Unferth. And Unferth challenges Beowulf, and Beowulf responds to that challenge as, here, what, what are you talking about, dude? And really kind of puts Unferth in his place. Then he has the battle with Grendel, and after the battle, when he's going to um, uh, uh, go into the lake and but fight Grendel's mother, Unferth lends Beowulf his sword. Um, here's another version of that same passage by, translated by Tolkien. Hrunting was the name of that hafted blade. Preeminent among old and precious things was that. Of iron was, of iron was the blade, stained with the device of branching venom, made hard in the blood of battle. So Beowulf takes Hrunting down into the cave under the lake, and he engages in battle with the, the mother, and it fails to bite. It says, Then in a fury he flung his sword away. The keen inlaid worm-looped pattern steel was hurled to the ground. So why does the sword fail? Why does Hrunting not bite? Well, there's different um, theories on this that scholars have put forward. One is, and this is sort of the Christian overlay, um, which is not in contradiction with the pagan version, says that only grace comes from God, and that Beowulf, by bringing uh, um, Hrunting in, was not relying on, on God's grace, but on his own strength and his own resources, and, the, and it was God who caused the giant sword to appear, and uh, it was only when he gave up what he brought and, and used the things of God that he had the grace to kill Grendel's mother. That is one theory. The theory that I prefer um, is that uh, the sword took on the quality of its previous owner and the acts it was given to do with, by its previous owner. We've learned in the text that Unferth has killed his family, his brothers, um, and it is implied that Unferth, oh, I must be sweating. They're handing me something to mop my forehead. And with this much forehead, the glare is probably killing you. Um, but uh, uh, so, Unferth, it's implied that Unferth uses Hrunting to kill his brothers. So the blade is a treacherous blade. It's made for dark work. And you have to ask yourself, why would Unferth give Beowulf this sword? Why is he suddenly being nice? Um, he just challenged Beowulf and was put in his place. Um, he, you know, so the idea is that he would give this sword to Beowulf, not as an act of benevolence, but perhaps... There's one idea that Jake had was to, uh, and this is apparently common in other Anglo-Saxon literature, that if something is cursed, you can pass the curse to another. Uh, and so maybe perhaps Unferth is trying to pass the curse along, um, or maybe it was just the fact that Unferth's uh, treacherous, backstabbing, and uh, cowardly nature crept and seeped into the blade itself. So I wanted to, in making this sword, I wanted to try to capture something that was sinister looking and beautiful. And I thought that the sketch plus the, um, the artifact from Fermo was very, uh, it, it met those qualities. And I also wanted to make something that was congruent with what we know about the sword from the text itself. Um, the, uh, you can see at the end of these words here, these are the original Old English words, the end mal, right? That basically means markings. So we know that hrunting was a pattern welded blade because um, hringmal and wandermal, I'm probably mispronouncing those words terribly, mean curving patterns and twisting patterns in the mal. And um, gleaming with twigs of venom, this is uh, interesting and there's been a lot of discussion on this by many people, but if you, if you look at this twisted bit in the middle, that is a twist pattern and it, you bring this out by acid. This is how you would reveal the pattern. 
So some scholars have, incorrectly in my opinion, translated this to mean that the sword itself was coated with poison. But it would be a much more elegant explanation to say that no, the, the, the twigs that are apparent on the blade, uh, it's a kenning for the pattern, uh, which is a, a kenning is an implied metaphor or a trope, and it comes out through the poison of the acid that is used to etch and reveal the pattern. Um, and so uh, the, gleaming with twigs of venom. And uh, the other two uh, sort of, um, the, the alternate explanation for this part is that some, some translations have hunting as hardened in blood, as if it was in the forging process, heated up red hot and then quenched in blood. Um, I don't think that's what that they actually meant. Um, one of the things to think about uh, with swords is they were personified in this literature. They thought of them as sentient in a certain capacity, thought of them as having character and intentionality. And um, uh, one of the kennings that I really like for a sword is called Survivor of the Files. And if you think about that, that's an elegant way of, so when a, when a swordsmith forges the blade roughly, you then move to files and stones to hone the blade and bring out its final shape. Well, if you think about the sword is, uh, that's left as the survivor of the, the battle with the files, you can see that they thought of the sword as an individual, as somebody with intentionality. Um, and the, the same thing is true with this hardened in the blood of battle. There's another Anglo-Saxon story in which a character picks up a sword that's been thrown into a fire, and his companion says, it has turned blue, it has gone soft, it has lost its temper, and his, uh, the guy that picks it up says, I will harden it in the blood of my enemies. So you could see that the idea would be that um, through battle, just like a warrior would become hard in battle, um, the blood of enemies on a sword hardens it. So I think that is the more appropriate interpretation. I had a lot more textual analysis in my presentation, but my friend Teresa Derrickson listened to my original presentation. Hi, Teresa, if you're watching. And she said I was going to bore you all to death uh, with text analysis, so I cut about six more slides away. And now I'm going to tell you how I made this thing. <clears throat> so... When you start out a pattern weld, you saw some of this in Owen's presentation. Uh, when you make a pattern welded sword that's a multi-bar like this, you start out with different bars of pattern weld. So you can see here on my bench, um, it is the, the individual bars are laid out. There are The bars on the edge have about 1,000 layers, which means they started out as a stack of about 20 different, um, 20 different layers of different types of steel. And it was fused together in the forge and fold back on itself until it reached a thousand layers. I then drew it out to a really long rod and chopped it in half. That's the bits that are gonna be on the edge. Then these in the middle, if you can kind of see these, um, these highlight lines in the middle, um, were about 16 layers that you then just rotate 90 degrees. So you've seen the edge of these layers as if it's the edge of a book. Imagine looking at this book like this and you see the edges running this way. So if I then flip it up like that, that's what that is. And in the middle is another one of those 16 layer bars twisted. And this is what it looks like once it's ready to weld up. And one note, you'll notice here that I have tack welds on the surface. This is not recommended for tacking together your billets um, because you'll end up with strange gray splotches in your um, actual pattern unless you know that that bit's either gonna become tang or is gonna be cut out. So you can see that I actually have this in the triangle pattern because later I was going to do this. So that bit was gonna be cut out anyway, and that bit was gonna be squished down to become the tang, which is the stick of metal that goes through there. So if there's any gray dots, it's hidden by the grip anyway. And this is what it looks like I'm to, when, I, when you're twisting the bars. I'm lucky I have an induction forge, and these things are the closest you get to magic. This is a very traditional way of doing it, you can tell. Um, so this is a video that shows what it looks like when we... You see, I didn't just... Don't, don't need a hydraulic twisting machine like Owen did for something like this. So, and you see there, I just tip forward and I just rinse, repeat. That's how, uh, 
That's how I put the twists in. Um, and the, uh, the neat thing about the, um, the induction forges, that's, sh that's my shop in Florida, and it was like 95 degrees outside, so I can be in the shop with air conditioning going doing that, which you can't do with a forge that kills you with carbon mon monoxide. Um, uh, the way that works, by the way, is it, th think of it this way. It's like an um, electromagnet that it reverses itself. So if you rub your hands together, you generate heat from friction. The little steel molecules are going back and forth, back and forth. The heat's generated inside of the steel instead of radiated in from an external heat source. Then, after the bars are tacked together, we forge weld them together. And again, you saw this in uh, Owen's presentation, but on a smaller version. looks like. And after that, you uh, forge it to shape. Now, in hindsight, I really wish that I had, um, what, what, you know, if you're somebody like Owen, you can, I've, I saw him in 2013 forge the final artifact blade down to a very close to shape forge. I'm just not that good with a hammer. So I tend to get it kind of close and then I grind it to shape. But I realized on this one that I couldn't quite do that because I wanted the middle bit to actually curve up with the tip. And you'd have to get a close up of this to see that the, the, the edge bit at, actually meets. So if I were to just kind of get it close and then grind this shape on it, you'd see I'd be cutting through those bars and it just wouldn't look cool. So I was forced to actually uh, uh, forge it very close to shape. This is when it's done being forged to shape. This is halfway through the forging. This is when I was done forged to shape lying on my driveway. I just took a, one of those glam shots on it. And this is a bad photo because I took it, like you're never supposed to use iPhones up and down to take the photos, I always turn it to the right, I just didn't. Um, so this is, go like this to see it, but you can kind of see it, it forged the shape and you can see the remnants of the twisted bars through here and you can see the way I <laughs> forged the shape is I actually take my template of what I want the sh shape to be and I put it in with Sharpie on the, on the anvil so I can go, not there yet, um, and uh, go back and forth. Now, then, most of the time um, that on this sword is spent um, in this. It's a relatively complex grind because you've got a relatively shallow, um, uh, excuse me, small diameter hollow grind here, which then transitions, it kind of goes down like this and then into a convex grind and you've got the small fuller which tapers down and you've got this ridge here on that, that, that's flat on top. So I was able to do some of it with the grinder, but um, it's just funny, everybody thinks, I think Yule and I were talking about this on Facebook once, everybody focuses on the red hot bits of metal and just, ah, we're manly men forging stuff. But they should really call us sandpaper smiths because we spend most of our time with just embrace, just sanding, sanding, sanding. I think Yule, you said something like, yes, it's true, you think it's fire and sparks and the blood of your enemies, but it's all just sanding, sanding, sanding. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one trick that, uh, that I do, which probably many people know about already, is these were the grinding wheels that were used to grind this bit, that bit, and the fuller. So why not use those actually as your sanding blocks themselves? So you get self-adhesive um, uh, tape, uh, uh, you know what I mean, sandpaper, that stuff. You actually tape, uh, adhere it to the outside of the wheel and then just sit there and enjoy the arm workout that you're getting. And this is what it looks like once the blade is polished and etched. So that was the, now the unmounted blade. And in this shot here, you can sort of see, I was pleased we got some nice chatoyance, which is kind of like that um, uh, iridescent effect that happens, like almost a hologram, like Jake was talking about on one of his pieces. You can see the, the 90 degree curve and the and this is, this is a good illustration of how um, stars come up. It was asked, why did Owen um, not forge in the fuller or something like that? And this is what he meant. You can see that back here, I've got these stars. Um, but here, I just have stripes like this. Well, that's where the fuller ends. So with certain patterns, you have to reveal the pattern by grinding into the strata. Um, uh, certain patterns, you can't grind too much or you'll grind the pattern out. Certain patterns you must grind to achieve the pattern, and stars in um, twists are one of those that you have to grind. 
Then, once again, very traditionally, um, I uh, milled out of wax uh, the basic shape for the guard. Um, uh, Jake can, will show you how to carve wax as an expert will. This is how a amateur carves wax. I just want to make sure that everything's uh, and I, it, Jake has been very generous in helping me learn lost wax casting, but it's been a bit like watching a Three Stooges video from his perspective, I'm guessing, because it's just been like, you know, ah, gee, ah, it's just, I, I almost set my shop on fire once with a bronze explosion. If you come to my shop in Florida, there's this wonderful burn mark in the center of my floor that's exactly, strangely enough, the shape of a large crucible I have. How that happened, who knows? Um, so, okay, so I carved this out of... Um, out of wax, and this is a picture of it fitted to the blade um, and the design. One of the things that I do, I don't know if everybody does this, some people I'm sure um, uh, don't do this, but I draw out my swords um, in Adobe Illustrator precisely as I want them, and then I cut out uh, with paper and use them for the blade and so on, so I can have an exact template uh, for how I want the blade to be. Uh, with the sword I'm doing with Jake, the demon sword, I because it's such a large piece, I didn't, want, I didn't want to risk using paper because you can shift. So actually, in the picture in Jake's presentation you saw of me holding the blade, that's actually an aluminum template that I sent away and had laser cut, so I have a precise uh, template to work against. So this is what it looks like when you've got a, a wee thing to cast. You remember Jake's sprues were like big manly sprues, and that these are like little girly sprues. Um, but um, you can see this is what it looks like uh, with where the uh, bronze is going to go. And this is what it looked like after it was cast. You might ask, why didn't I cast it with any of the ornamentation or the edges rounded over? Because I was pretty sure I was going to screw it up and start over. Um, I was actually surprised this was the first attempt. So. Um, and this is a little video of me casting. Unfortunately, you just see the back of my head, but it's close as you can get. So that's me putting into a uh, vacuum chamber the investment into the flask. I'm turning on the vacuum there. Now I'm pouring the bronze from a tiny little crucible compared to Jake's big crucible. That's, you can see like Jake was talking about, after the uh, sprue cap is turned black, I'll take it out, I put it in a bucket of water, jump back quickly, it just makes scary sounds. There's, there's the demon sword in the corner. And there it is, that's how it comes back. That's it fitted to the blade, not shaped yet. And then I did the same thing with the pommel. You can see I was a little bit bolder this time and actually rounded off the edges at least. I figured, yeah, at least a 50% chance of, of winning. And oh, I should be looking at the camera, not looking back there. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, putting the, the, the grip together. I used uh, buffalo horn uh, for the material and uh, copper for these right here. So you can see what it looks like. And then this is where before any uh, patina or ornamentation um, is applied, what it looks like uh, before this then, um, I ended up uh, putting uh, file work on. Um, this was acid etched to, to do the recession and then the, um, the rivet, the simulated rivet heads were carved in and then this was patinaed and there was also some lines put on and some shots of it finished. And that is my presentation on hunting, the sword that failed. Um, and uh, here it is. That's it. Any questions? How do you approach making such a narrow fuller? Do you rough forge it? Uh, or do you have a narrow contact wheel and get in there with that? I have a narrow contact wheel. This is, uh, this is ground. This is not um, forged. Um, and uh, I uh, built a jig. Um, actually, if you go to the Bladesmiths Forum, actually don't go to Bladesmiths Forum, go to Google and type in site, S-I-T-E colon, bladesmithsforum.com, and then type in fuller grinding, um, you'll get a list of a bunch of, of uh, threads 
on the Bladesmiths forum about how to grind fullers, and on there I have a thread explaining how I do um, uh, fuller grinding. The main part is, uh, basically I, I take the, the, the blade, I put it on a, a platent, and I clamp it to an aluminum piece of angle iron to keep it, um, to keep it 90 degree to the wheel, and uh, then you have to have some sort of Z control where you can go up or down, and you just pass it back and forth to make it perfectly straight. Obviously, it has to be, the fuller itself has to be perpendicular to the wheel. So two more questions. One of the things I enjoy uh, in the making process is uh, the discovery process. Is what, might, what might happen is you make it. Do you find having a solid template, quote, keeps you honest during the build process? And do you ever allow yourself any room to adapt your pieces? Really? What keeps me honest is knowing that I'm going to have to hand this to these guys. <laughs> that's why I think that's one of the best parts about uh, having a group uh, like this is, is just knowing that, like, you know, because you can take photos of something and it can hide more than it, um, it reveals. But uh, if you're handing it to men who you respect and you respect their skills and, and uh, you, you know they're going to be looking at it closely, you don't compromise. You try not to. Last question from Justin. If you thought that your lower cross card casting might fail, is there a reason you didn't make an RTB silicone mold first so that you could recreate your wax without going through all the work on the mold yet? A very good reason. I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> I still don't. Yeah. And there were many accolades uh, on the questions, but that's the last question. Great. Peter. Well, I, I would like to hear you talk more about um, how you, what your experience is working with um, a sword that is clearly also a, a concept of things hmm. and, and relating to uh, drawing and, and what it might be. I mean, we don't need a historical, um, it's, it's not about that part of it, but more on a, on a personal level as, as a maker, mm -hmm. because I, what I hear in these questions are like, okay, you all have these precise patterns. What, doesn't that confine you kind of thing? Mm. Isn't, isn't it stifling? And also like, how can you, how can you keep relating to them? Mm. And, and I think because that's a part of making that may be um, unfamiliar, alien, or, or quite contrary to how many approach blade uh, making. Yeah. I, I have this sense that for many, blade making is like an, uh, an exercise in freedom at last. Mm -hmm. Because I, I have to uh, adhere to all these rules in my work, so mm -hmm. now I do this and I can be free and I can do whatever I like, I can go with the flow and all mm -hmm. that. And what you tell us now is that you actually follow uh, a plan and precise patterns, and could you, could sure. you reflect on that? A yeah, bit? Um, I don't um, wing it at all, and it doesn't matter if I'm going from a historical pattern or one that I came up with myself. Um, I uh, I have to know where I'm going to get there, and so it's. But there's nothing. Um, uh, to me, that doesn't uh, diminish the experience. To me, the swordsmithing is a very uh, spiritual, relaxing thing. Um, I, uh, you know, there's a, a Joseph Campbell once talked about the concept of eternity in um, in myths about how um, you know afterlives are called eternal, and he said, you know, that's a, a, a metaphor. Eternity is not a really long time. It's not some time that's going to happen later. Eternity is that aspect of here and now where you lose track of time and you totally live in the moment. And swordsmithing is the one point in my life when I actually do that. I experience that timelessness. And working within a, a structure that I've decided on ahead of time, that, you know, that illustrator uh, design is actually um, not confining. It's the... It's the discipline you, that causes you to just fall into that. So I, you know, this, whether it's sanding or filing or even the problem solving process, um, I don't find it uh, restrictive at all. It's, um, uh, what was it? I think we were talking about when we talked about the other, um, the boundaries are what define you. Um, and so you've got to know where the object stops and starts. So not to me. <laughs>